Hey everyone, this is Craig here. I wanted to let you know that starting in October, on October 16th, we will formally start our Bataille Reading Group's reading of The Accursed Share, Volume 1. This reading group here is in addition to our A Thousand Plateaus reading group, which has been going on all year and happens at the end of the month. If you become a patron at any level, you can join our A Thousand Plateaus reading group. However, if you join at the mid-tier level, you can be a member of both reading groups. And for the A Thousand Plateaus reading group, we already have recordings on our Patreon site. If you could, we would like you to support us in any way you can, even if it's just reading our blogs, or telling a friend about our podcast, or maybe purchasing something from our merch store. Also, you can purchase The Philosopher's Tarot, a tarot deck that I created coming out soon on Repeater Books. In fact, it drops on November 8th. In any event, support of any kind helps keep this podcast going. If you would like to support us in any way or extend your engagement with what we do, drop into the show notes where we have a link tree link that has the links to everything that we do. Okay, today we're talking with Nicholas Thoburn on the topic of Deleuze, Marx, and politics. Let's check in on the conversation. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today we have a very important question. The question is, was Gilles Deleuze a Marxist? Was he a communist? And if so, to what extent or in what way? And to answer that question, there's a few important things that we're going to address, namely what may have been Gilles Deleuze's last book entitled The Grandeur of Marx. We don't have that text. However, today with us, we have author Nick Thoburn, and we're going to talk about his book, Deleuze, Marx, and Politics. And we're going to go into the concepts within Deleuze and Guattari's work that either resonate with Marx's concepts or elaborate them in some way. And as I understand it, Nick, uh, you are currently working at the University of Manchester and you got your PhD at Goldsmiths. How did you land upon this research? Why did you think it was important? And what was the process that led up to this particular book? Well, I mean, that's a, I, in some ways a biographical question and something about chance and this that last interview, which I'm sure we'll talk about. So I, I had I guess I'd come up through anarchist politics and through the anti-poll tax movement, very important kind of post minor strike time in Britain, but it got a bit tired of the sort of the subjectivism of anarchism. Read Foucault and Deleuze and the Situationists and started reading kind of left communist stuff. And that all kind of came together around the time I started my PhD in 95. And Deleuze at this time was saying that he was a Marxist. So I was interested in what this might bring to politics, to communism, and to to thinking about Deleuze. So that was the kind of drive of the book, but filtered through very sort of definite communist problems about the refusal of work and the relation between minority and proletariat, stuff like that. It's our own Matthew who put this episode together. He had a very successful tweet several weeks ago about Deleuze's The Grandeur of Marx that got some attention, which led us to invite you on the show. And hopefully we can dig into the details of what might have appeared in that book, but more broadly, what Marx's impact was. So I'm going to let Matt kind of take it away and ask some of the main questions to get us started. Uh, Thanks for coming on. Yeah, so this thing got started because I became interested again in this question of his unpublished last work of Deleuze, The Greatest Marx, because it's mentioned in a few footnotes about like a newspaper interview. We, we know that he was working on something. I was interested in how much we actually know about it. We know anything about the claims. And so I put together a, a blog post about it. And uh, Nick, very basically really helpful, and sort of tweets to reply to it. So I mentioned his book in my post. So that's how this came about, was this question of Deleuze and his relation to Marx. And what I'm hoping is we sort of start maybe from some sort of big, broad questions. And then as we sort of hash out the details, we can sort of get close to the correct sort of to the truth of it, I guess. If push comes to shove, I asked you, was Deleuze actually a Marxist? It, it was like a, basically a yes or no answer. What would your starting point be? And then we can sort of drill down why there's lots of asterisks next to it. So for me, it's a definite yes, of course. It's the premise of my book, Deleuze and Guattari Marxists, indeed that they're communists thinkers. Now, I think I heard it a, a little bit in, in the opening questions, and it was certainly true when I started doing the work on this, that people had real trouble grasping that, which struck me as a very strange thing since the capitalism schizophrenia, by far 
for, to, for my mind, the most important books of Deleuze, thoroughly permeated by Marx's concepts, themes, and problems. And Deleuze says he's a Marxist. In the interview with Tony Negri in 1990, where he makes this case that also is apparent in Antidipus, that his philosophy turns on analysis of capitalism, and capitalism is an is a, a, an imminent system that keeps setting and overcoming limits and comes up against them at a wider scale because the fundamental limits capital itself. That's a thoroughly Marxian mm. problem. So this is at the center of his philosophy. And then in 1993, in conversation with Didier Eribon in that piece that was published just, I think, the day after he died, he says it again. He reaffirms that he's a Marxist. He sounds bemused that anyone would think he wasn't. And he's also bemused that Anyone wouldn't undersee the un, understand the centrality of Marxism mm. for understanding the world today. And in a sense, for me, the point is not is he a Marxist, but to begin from that principle and then see what that does as one kind mm. of works his work. You might then object to me calling him a communist. That's perhaps a little bit more controversial, and it's true that Deleuze he doesn't call himself, he doesn't identify himself this way, although the Guattari does. But I think his reticence is internal to his Marxism in, in an important way, because communist modes of thought and being are radically excessive of identity. They're operative at the limits of identity, against identity. There's a beautiful line from Blanchot that I'm fond of quoting, where he says, communism is that which excludes and excludes itself from every community already constituted. It's radically anti-identitarian. And yet, in Deleuze's time, communism was a name saturated with conservative forms of identity, particularly in France, the Trotskyist groupuscules, the Soviet national states, the European communist parties, all agents of political and social and libidinal repression. And so I think you can understand why he doesn't choose to call himself communist in separation mm -hmm. from those kind of traditions. But or, I say that for Deleuze, it's not for me. I mean, I'm, I find it very useful to call myself communist, but I understand what's going on. And I don't think it's a mark of somehow a less radicalism in him, almost the opposite. Mm. So I think that for me, the big question then is not, was he a Marxist, but what kind of Marxist was he? And he himself makes that intriguing point with Negri when he says, with Sari and I were both Marxists in our different ways, perhaps. And I think that question, what kind of Marxist he is, is crucial for understanding is well it's crucial and i think we have to see him as a break a radical break with traditional marxism or orthodox marxism as it's sometimes uh, called the marxism of lenin trotsky mao gramsci the marxism of the historical workers movement the marxism that was ascendant through the 20th century and for this traditional marxism socialism is about the takeover the state takeover of existing forces of production. The management of labor by the workers' state is the critique of capitalism from the standpoint of labor seeking an equitable distribution of labor's products, um, but not the abolition of labor. And I think Deleuze's position is against all of that. But it, he's not alone. It's that it's the opposition to traditional Marxism that comes from left communism, from the ultra left from people like Moshe Postone, from value form theory, from communization theory, from black Marxism, some of it, from feminist Marxism, all of, for all of whom communism is not about the better management of labor and the distribution of its products, but labor's at the abolition of the capitalist mode of production and everything that comes with it. And I think the enormity of that transformation of social being is really not lost on Deleuze and, and mm. Ritari. So they refer to it there's nothing less than the creation of a new earth. So, you know, they're Marxists, but better than that, their Marxism is not traditional Marxism. It's not social democracy. It's not the Gramscian hegemony. It's really the thought of a vertiginous, radical communism, albeit that they don't tend to use that name. I'm just going to ask a question about the discrepancies between, let's say, the PCF, the Communist Party of France, the Soviet Union, sort of the, yeah, the, as you're saying, the moniker communism, what it means in terms of a set of political identities. And I wanted to ask you how that fits into the question of Deleuze and Marx underneath the wider question of democracy. Because all of these kinds of 
conservative kinds of yeah i mean i'm gonna say conservative kinds of communism stalin was a very conservative man i think we've come this far we can say this <laughs> it's a you know, it always it always it presents the soviet democracy say in the, the early constitution in the 30s in the form of the people it's always you know the people's state it's not just the work the workers constitute the capital t capital p people and of course for Deleuze Guattari, the people is always absent in their communism in that sense that rejection of a almost like a Rousseauian kind of constitution of the capital T, capital P people, or the demos. Where does that stand, do you think, in terms of a Zelazian theory of democracy? Not in the sense of, I'm not asking in the sense, are they anti-democratic? But how do you think the Marxist inflections in Deleuze reformulate how he approaches that question of the people, when these people are, are absent? Great. So yeah, as you say, he makes this point that the people are missing and they should not be constituted in order for the problem to change. So people often think the people are missing, but they're coming. And no, there's no people that shouldn't be a people. Now, I mean, we'll come back to this, I hope, later on today. I think in place of the people, in place of the subject, they have the figure of the minor, which is a radically desubjectified field of political praxis, which I, well, which they absolutely relate to the proletariat. So I think the proletariat is the term and the minor is the term against the people, but they're very different kinds of formulation. They're asubjective or even anti-subjective formulations. But I think we'll be, hopefully we'll come to that later. In terms of your question, I don't know about democracy. I, clearly we live in times where liberal democracy is being slaughtered. It's slashed. It, we can't really imagine democracy in its current form providing anything other than penury and pain and death. So the idea that it's something we should sort of hold on to or retrieve or something like this is one that I think becomes harder and harder to maintain. And yet, of course, this is what the right is sort of trying to undo democracy in towards fascism. So we have to be quite careful how we tread here, I guess is what I'd say, first of all. But for me, Deleuze isn't a theorist of democracy. For me, Marx, at his best, isn't a theorist of democracy. Clearly, there are many Marxes, and there are some that are quite kind of traditionally, quite traditional sort of Democrats, I suppose. But at his best, he's not a theorist of democracy. And I'm personally interested in that vein or that current in, in, in communism that, that doesn't want to hold on to democracy as a term. That sees democracy as the separation of conception from execution. That sees democracy as the kind of liberal rights that hides the realities of, of exploitation and denigration and destruction. <laughs> so the question then is what does communism give us that isn't democracy? And I think that's a really big question. I'm not sure I can quite answer it here, but I guess I would separate Deleuze I personally would say Blake Deleuze very strongly from the sort of Leclerc move, radical democracy kinds of space. I don't think that's his thing at all. He says very little about democracy. And when he does, there's a nice line in the, I think it's in the mediator's essay interview with Claire Parnay, where he says democracy is like a grid. Or the, he says elections are like a grid. They filter everything through mm. their play, turn everything into democratic problems. And this isn't just one day of the year. This is throughout the year. This is the nature of capitalist democracy. And then, you know, in what is philosophy, they say what social democracy hasn't pulled out the gun to and the poor come out to their ghetto. And he talks about the misery, the shame of daily life in democracy. Now, I know he does at one point, or they at one point in what is philosophy, talk about becoming democratic. And I know kind of socialist Deleuzeans and liberal Deleuzeans hold on to that moment. But I think it's one line in an otherwise uh, uh, system of thought that's really pretty critical of democracy. Not because it's elitist, but because it's communist, would be how I'd pitch it. I think Adam's like being a bit cheeky there because he knows that my mono breaks my PhD at the moment, but my PhD is on Deleuze as a, not maybe not as a theorist of radical democracy, but as someone that radical democratic theory could learn from. Uh, okay. <laughs> where well, we could basically... all over this. Yeah, my, my answer to that sort of question was basically to just say, like, democracy equals communist and problem solved. But no, no, well, I, you I, I, have to be careful. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be waving a flag for anti-democracy these days. I think that's a different kind of, you put yourself into quite dangerous positions there, which I certainly yeah. wouldn't want to go. Yeah. I and mean, it's that line in what's philosophy that sort of a lot of us to sort of wonder about this and what, what it means. It's, I used to know off, off the top of my head, it was the coming democratic, but it's not identical with the history of actual democracy or something like that. It's a yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite ambiguous claim. And Guattari, I think, uses the word a fair bit to... Craig has a question. 
I'm imagining a Marxist clicking on this podcast for the first time and maybe wondering about what the merits of Deleuze's and Deleuze and Gattari's theory might be for a theory of communism. And so this is a kind of a two-part question. What do you think that Marxists today, and, I, and I'm just talking about people that, that we see in movements and see online and so forth, what stands out in Deleuze and Gattari's theories ontologically, ethically, politically, that's usable for them? And maybe if we turn that around too, what do you think that real existing Deleuzeanism might be lacking that they could retrieve from Marxism? Yeah, I mean, they're great questions and difficult ones to answer, I think. I, so Marxists, on the whole, dislike Deleuze pretty intensely, certainly in the Anglo-American world. I think that's changed a little bit, but it's not changed a huge deal. I think it's partly because, well, there are any number of reasons to that. One of them is that I think Negri became, he sort of positioned himself in some ways and then became marketed and known as the sort of, if you like, the realization of the latent Marxism in Deleuze, it kind of negatively became the kind of Deleuze Marxist of a store. And since many Marxists, I think with good reason, the critical of Negri, they then became critical of Deleuze along with that. I think that's there's something in there, although of course Deleuze was around for considerably longer than Empire was, was published and so on. So that I think why there's some resistance to that's one of the reasons why there's some resistance to Deleuze. Why they should be interested, or if they were inclined. Well, maybe the, I would say that's actually all sorts of really fundamentally significant <laughs> engagements with Marxian problematics in, in The Thousand Plateaus and in, and in Antidipus. So I think Marxists will, will actually, can actually find in those books really thoughtful engagement with their concepts and tussling with their concepts, taking them perhaps in some different ways. But you might they might then say, well, yeah, fine, but we work with our own concepts. We don't need to help. They in some cases, I think that's probably true. So what Deleuze brings to communism and to Marxism, I think, well, we'll talk about this more in a bit, I think, but I certainly think that the theory of minority is a very interesting way of thinking not only about the relationship between kind of minorities and class, thinking about the crisis of class, thinking about the crisis of capital, thinking about the consistency and the qualities of communist politics as a kind of mode of being perhaps and i've done a lot of work on there on how we can think of their minor literature as a means of thinking about communist modes of expression communist forms of composition which become very interesting all this stuff about the impersonal voice and mediators and fabulation i think communism can learn quite a lot from that yeah well we we're just thinking that one helpful thing here might be to for listeners who, I mean, we, well, I think most of us know a little bit about us in Italian fairness, but we can't assume that. So would you mind sort of telling us a little bit more what we mean, what does Italian mean by, by, but the minor or the or minority or minorities and so on? Because you implied earlier that it's sort of a, in language of like a rough analog or very sort of version of the proletariat that Marxists might be thinking of, like instead they're going to say the minor or, or so on. So could you tell us a little more about that and sort of, so we all know where we stand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is fundamental, so I can, you might have to stop me talking about it. So I, I think that to engage with the question of communism in Deleuze is to engage with the, the, their theory of the minor, minor politics or minoritarian politics, which, you know, as I said earlier, they directly relate to Marx's proletariat. So, you know, if we, if we are going to talk about communism, we need to talk about the proletariat. And if we're doing it by Deleuze, I think we have to talk about the minor. And of course, Marx's proletariat is this very strange beautifully strange category or concept. It's a class of radical chains. It's the class of dissolved and self-dissolving private property. It's a very, it's a very intriguing formulation that is not at all some kind of super subject. It's some kind of simple collectivity. And there's a passage in A Thousand Plateaus, which for me is vital to their Marxism, to their communism, where they, they say, this is a quotation. They say, the power of minority, of particularity, finds its figure or its universal consciousness in the proletariat. But as long as the working class defines itself by an acquired status or even by a theoretically conquered state, it appears only as capital, a part of capital, variable capital. It does not leave the plan or the plane of capital. Or as they put it more bluntly, at the same time, place, quoting the Italian Marxist Mario Tronzi, this 
great line from Tron to, he says, to struggle against capital, the working class must fight against itself insofar as it is capital. I mean, it's a beautiful line, although actually really that's what, it's just rephrasing Marx's own statement to that effect. It's not an, it's not an innovation from operation necessarily. So I think the minor needs to be understood in terms of this really rather strange self-abolishing class that is the proletariat. That's the first thing I'd say. So the question of what is the minor, what is the minoritarian? Well, I think the fundamental question is how, uh, you know, the role of the social, okay, the role of the social in thinking what the minor is. And Deleuze and Guattari bring that to light by comparing the minor to the majoritarian. So if I work through that just a little bit, the major condition is the set of identities that are constituted in and nurtured by social relations, by the self-bolstering security that class, race, gender, health, citizenship, and so forth confer on those who inhabit the privileged position in these social configurations. So in the major condition, there's a fit between the individual and the social that is so perfect that the individual gains autonomy, paradoxically, because it's wholly produced by the social, but it's produced so effectively it gains autonomy on one side and on the other, the social falls away and becomes experienced as mere background. That's a line from Kafka, mere background, inconsequential background to the free play of individual concerns across this sort of enabling plane of society. Now, compared to that major identity, the relationship between the individual and the social in the minoritarian condition, and we can no longer say the minority can identity, is that th these are minorities, those, those that lift the minor condition, experience those that are positioned unfavorably um, in relationship to those privileged major poles of class, race, gender, and so forth. So social relations no longer facilitate coherent identity. Rather, the social milieu pulls identity apart. Any particular identity is coursing with hostile social relations that pull it apart, that undo it, that render identity impossible, conflictual. Life becomes a tangle of competing constraints, competing social relations that pull one apart. And this is the condition that Deleuze and Guattari call cramp. And in, in cramp space, the particular individual, well, what we might have previously call individual concern, is always coursing with social relations. So everything is political. Nothing is left alone. And so the social is now not the mere background. It's the very substance of everything as a hostile terrain, but at the same time, the hostile terrain that is the condition of a real politics, rather than a politics that, as Marx says, simply leaves the pillars of the building standing. It's a social politics. And this relate this sort of understanding about the social and the individual or the social and the particular relate to each other is actually very close to what Marx says in particular in his essay on the Jewish question, you know, which as the title makes plain, is very much concerned also with the relation between majorities and minorities. And Marx too here says that for the bourgeois citizen or the majority individual, the social is a mere background. But it's a background that, that is experienced as sort of nagging threat, the threat to the autonomy of the individual. And Marx says, well, no, it's not like that at all. The real threat, the threat to the good life is not society. It's the freedom or the liberty of the individual, in his cutting phrase, the individual confined to himself. The, the liberty of the isolated individual is the real horror the real constraint. The product of capitalist society masquerades as its cause and then gets all upset when society causes any difficulty. And what that individual does is constrain or prevent the sort of excessive sociality of species being, or the excessive sociality of communal being from flourishing, constrains it to property, constrains it to identity. But it's worse than that. Not only is the bourgeois individual that kind of dull and limiting and constraint. It's a subjective form that is only available to a certain class, race, and gender. And it ab actively constitutes itself in opposition to, to those who are property, i.e. slaves, or those who have a tenuous relationship to property, i.e. the working class, women, racialized others. So they're excluded from the social, and then their exclusion is naturalized as apolitical, or outside the polit politics. And Marx says, well, now let's flip it. Let's make that excluded mass and all of their social conditions the basis for communist politics. And now it's not 
a politics based on the free play of individuals in the democratic sphere. Now it's a politics based on the real social relations that are coursing through their lives. And that here lies the hope of communism, not just to overcome oppression, but to, if you like, construct the sort of the this sort of metabolism, this social complexity that is species being or communal being against the capitalist form of property. But that sounds exactly like Deleuze. Now, I know I'm trying to make it sound like Deleuze, but that really is what he says in On the Jewish Question. It's interesting that Deleuze and Guattari don't refer to that text, but it, to me, it feels very, very close. Now, that's not the only thing to say about the proletariat. That's not the only thing to talk about how the minor and the proletariat relate. And there's also these this fundamental question of the, the structure of the proletariat is that which that which produces capital and at the same time produces the means by which it is rendered superfluous to capital. You know, so the proletariat both produces its own domination in work and it produces the means by which it will be thrown out of work and rendered ever more precarious in work. Now, I think that structural condition, again, very important for Deleuze and Guattari, is also very important for thinking about the periodization of their Marxism. Of course, A Thousand Plateaus is, was written in, published in 1980. Things have changed, but actually I think they're quite prescient about the nature of the class relation today. So, I mean, that's the minor and the major. That's how those that the minor relates to the proletariat. There are other minor questions about how, what this does to the, I don't know, the substance of politics. If we could think of Marxism or communism as a minor science or as a minor literature as a minor praxis, but maybe I'll stop there for, for the minor. I mean, I have a few questions about this concept of becoming minor and its relation to the proletariat and that passage in the nomadology plateau that you cited earlier. It seems to me that there's an importance in political activity and this sort of, or I guess resistive or resisting activity rather than political that comes down to a relationship between becoming minor and incongruity with particular modes of production. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the relationship between becoming minor as it's posited in, in the nomadology plateau and some of the concerns that Deleuze has about political organizing in what is philosophy. And he seems it's not just a question of democracy, although it's an open animosity towards it. It seems to be a much deeper critique of the question of constituting a people, right? And this is a relationship that spans in political theory from Gramsci to Judith Butler, right? This capacity to posit a we the people. So mm. my question would be, what is the relationship <laughs> between Deleuze's A People to Come, which is a, a concept that only manifests a few times, and I think most extensively in Cinema 2, if I remember, and The Becoming Minor. What is the relationship between these people who are not here and the process of becoming minor, this incompatibility with the axiomatic of capital? Well, maybe just on the Cinema 2, what, the, what I like about the reading of the minor in cinema too is that at least once and i think in throughout the, or the mood of that that short section of the book is that he doesn't say the people are missing and are to come or what have you just as the people are missing and should not come where elsewhere he does tend to bring the two together the people are missing and they somehow should come and i think it's the latter part that i think is not the very delusion part and i prefer to leave aside because i think to pose the problem of the missing people and then to say politics should reconstitute in a way that is not about the people is so much more into the spirit of Deleuze's thought. It's also so much more of a challenge because we seem to be so unable to think of politics without, if not a people, then at least a subject of some kind, a collective. Maybe this goes back to Craig's question about what might Marxist get in it? Well, I think Deleuze gives us a politics without a subject. Politics of forms of, I don't know, event, forms of creation, forms of concrete practices that, that, that emerge and exist and proliferate against the strictures of subjectivity. Not just against the strictures of kind of liberal identity, but against all the strictures of identity, all of which ultimately configure and reconfigure, you know, a means of kind of 
reconfiguring modes of being that are suitable for the propagation of capitalism, let's say. So it's an anti-subjective form. So that's then you say, well, where the hell does it come from then if it's not coming from the people, the collective, or what have you? Well, I think it does come... And I think this is where Deleuze is actually very close to communization theory, though clearly communization theory wouldn't recognize that. Is that it? Op- that communism or composition politics comes from operating on the limits of any particular social identity or configuration, as it pushes beyond the constraint that identity is. So let's say it's, it's a perhaps a mistake to give a kind of almost workerist example, but you know, a strike that stays contained within its own workplace will reproduce the identity of that workplace before too long. Whereas a strike that breaks open the boundary of that workplace and starts engaging with the domestic workers or the unpaid or the unemployed and other workers in other factories and other sectors is starting to break the identity in the construction of, let's call it solidarity, but in the construction of that movement, that event. And Deleuze is not He's not insensitive to that. I think it's exactly those kinds of things that he's so interested in. We might call them, he wouldn't, it's not a phrase he would use, we might call them questions of composition. And then we have to remember how he's against all of that talk about it's all becoming, it's all rhizome, stuff like that. He's What he's really interested in is techniques and procedures and practices by which art, literature, music, and politics is constructed. I think that's what interested him most. It really is a philosophy of how to do it, if you like, and maybe not what is to be done. But, but it's always against the subject. It's always operating on the limits of those identities that are operative for capital. I guess one thing I'd say though is I'm not at all trying to say class first against identity politics or something like that. When I'm not really talking about identity politics in many ways. I think a lot of what gets called identity politics is quite close to what Deleuze and Quartari are doing in terms of the mind, but that's maybe a slightly different question. There seems to be a remarkable history of literature to come out of the consequences of workerism, aprismo, in Italy. One of the most notable being the two tycoon journals, which are highly influenced by Deleuze and Foucault, and also certain elements of Giorgio Gambin's ontology. But one of the one of the first points or atta- points of attack that they have against the politics of organizing pertains to the question of the proletariat. And they write in this is not a program every time that it has attempted to define itself as a class, the proletariat has lost itself, taken the dominant class, the bourgeois, for a model. And I wonder if. This seems to be the continual circle of debate that seems to misidentify the element of the revolutionary upshot in a politics of desubjectivation that sort of reactively says, oh, no, class first. And that that this is not the argument that Deleuze, Guattari, Foucault, Blanchot, etc. are making. (laughs) They're not positing a sort of (laughs) <laughs> taking material conditions and shooting them into the back of their critique of contemporary social ontology or something like that, right? But instead are looking to these activities that throughout history have chewed at the roots of these systems of domination. And I think like they when they take up this line of thought, they're sort of standing between the history of communism, but also the history of a particular response to to the philosophy of subjectivity, which you opened your your biography with as a sort of frustration with the history or the way in which certain forms of anarchist politics had taken up this question of subjectivity. But I'm wondering if a philosophy of or a political practice or an ethics of desubjectivation does not require at least a sort of approach to the subject. And if they don't have one, and I'm thinking of Deleuze's discussion of, of the fold in relation to Foucault's later term, subjectivation. I'm mm-hmm. wondering if does a politics of desubjectivation require philosophically an approach to the question of the subject? I think so. I think I think what's so extraordinary about a thousand plateaus in particular. I mean, it's the sense in which the human is so sort of 
fashion through this multitude of forces and forms so much so that the book can begins with the geology of morals we have to go to strata and stuff and i think they give us such a radical sense of the social production of subjectivity let's put it like that so but they it's not a theory of subjectivity or philosophy of subjectivity because they simply displace that question so they're interested in how are we engineered or to take Marx, the worker and the capitalist as subjectivities are merely functions of capital. He puts it that bluntly. And then, and so we have to understand how capital works to do those things. And so I just don't, and so with Marx too, there's just, I don't think there is a philosophy of subjectivity, or at least that's not their interest. Now, which is not to, but there is a philosophy of composition, we could call it, or political creation or, or what have you, which is to do with events and kind of impersonal forces and all of these things that sweep across and through and beyond the subject. And I think that's where the new earth is constituted almost with, without subjects on those grounds. Marx, he says, communism is a movement of absolute becoming. I mean, that can start, I can start sounding like a founder. Well, anyway, but I don't think there is a subject to be, to recover, to be reconstituted. I love what Deleuze says about Foucault. I always really enjoy Deleuze on Foucault and I love Foucault. Um, but I think when Deleuze is talking about the subjectivization work, as he does in those interviews that are collected in negotiations, I think Deleuze is feeling a little bit awkward. I think there's a sort of awkwardness there where he, and I think he almost says it, this is the route Foucault went at that point to do his great work on what he calls subjectivation, or subjectivation but that's not the route I would have gone, it seems to be his kind of position. I just feel a little bit of awkwardness there on his part. Well, uh, just to bring it back to the question of, yeah, what can this do for uh, Marxists? I mean, just to, I can give two things really. One, just to add on to what you've already said, Dick, in terms of one actual case of identity really fitting into this reproductive force of reproducing the major, and two, just the more metaphysical stuff in terms of the big word materialism, which is sometimes used you know, synonymously with Marxism. I mean, I mean, just to the listeners, I mean, think there's a union in the UK called GMB, famously one of the worst in the country, I must say. The police union is worst, actually. But they have this thing where they recently come out as pro-fracking because it means more jobs for them, or they previously had a thing where they were defending like weapons production because it reproduces the membership. And the strike never breaks out of it. It doesn't consider the very fact of proletarianization as the problem. I mean, this is the very problematic of a social democracy for the capital T, capital P, people because it then becomes the people of a nation i mean cedric robertson goes into this beautifully about the inability of certain marxist elements to understand the rise of nationalism and this is why delas and guattari would turn to a freudo marxist such as reich so i think they are very good in terms of thinking of the production of subjectivity and these very nagging questions i think a lot of marxists do feel like is why are people so attached to a slightly more gilded chain, or why they get caught in these national kinds of circuits of desire, which lead to the very phenomenon of social democracy, where the imperial core gets some needed material benefits, for example, healthcare and the like. And I mean, famously in the UK, that we lost nationalized dentistry so we could afford the Korean War. It was very much tied into the whole thing. But also with Marx and sorry, also with uh, Atlas Matari as well, they also give us a really good theory of matter. A matter, theory of matter, which is not in terms of discrete self-identical units, but a matter that's always in flows of production in the same way that we're always kept moving around through these circuits of production. But just to sort of round off on a question, I guess, it seemed to me just through reading some part of your book, Nick, that it was really the Marxism of the German ideology that you thought was, that resonated quite a lot with what Deleuze and Guattari are doing and the definition of communism they give, which is the abolition of the present state of things not simply a seasoning or an emboldening of the means of production in a way that keeps them identical to their functionality in terms of what they are. And just through the sort of links of German ideology, which is very much expressed by them in the section where they go on assault against a model of what looks now to us like Soviet communism. They attack uh, Stirner's definition of communism, which if you read it, just looks like what the Soviet Union ends up being. There's a capital T, capital P people, and individual people themselves always get the chopping block or the gulag or something. But I'd like to ask you about the German ideology and it, it, do you think that's a particularly resonant mode of Marxism for a sort of deleuze uh, kind of project? Yeah, it's interesting you raise that because of course I wrote this book a couple of decades ago. <laughs> yeah. it, that's not the way I would frame it now. I think I, I 
clearly that line about the abolition of the present state of things, it's very useful, important. I like it alongside Marx's line about the, the merciless criticism of all that exists, this yeah. impossible wrenching force that is Marxism, nothing, no stability. But what I would be more inclined to situate there, the Deleuze's Marxism now is in relation to capital and the, I mean, the book capital and the sense of the proletariat as a kind of impossible condition dominating itself in work and pushing itself out of work at the same time. Because I think that helps us periodize their Marxism in a way that I didn't do very effectively in, in the book. So in, in the book, I kind of turned back to Operismo and Autonomia, which is a hugely interesting mine of potential. And I do that in a way that's very critical of Negri and the sort of later autonomous stuff. But I think now um, what I haven't really grasped there, partly because I was batting against all of the stuff in the, about the fragment of machines and so on, is I hadn't really grasped this kind of tendential crisis of labor that uh, I think is fundamental to Deleuze and Guattari, although, you know, the, what, what Marx calls the general law of capitalist accumulation. It's not a phrase they use, interestingly, but they certainly start presenting the crisis of labor society or the crisis of Adam, what you were calling this kind of nationalist image of the worker, the white male heterosexual worker over 35, which traditional Marxism absolutely produced. I mean, when Marxists worry about that subject, well, it's in many ways, it's their product. They need, it, it, it's not the product of the more esoteric and the more left communist Marxism, but it's absolutely the product of traditional Marxism. Just read Gramsci's Fordism essay, where he starts singing the praises of industrial labor to fashion the good working class. Gramsci, who still is celebrated, lauded tremendously. So I don't want to say racism and sexism and nationalism is the fault of Marxism, but I think Marxism was internal to that for a very long time. And now, as I think Deleuze and Guattari see in A Thousand Plateaus, and now it's become ever more apparent, that model of identity is absolutely in crisis. It's, it's collapsed, it's gone. And what it's produced in part is a hugely interesting political condition, but it's also produced these especially reactionary formulations where, you know, the benefits that accrued to the white working class, and I don't mean, I don't mean white people who are working class, but the white working class that was integrated with the national project and that was often laborists and involved with Marxism. Well, that has now become so deeply reactionary because it, it's lost all its benefits and this it's so utterly racist and all the old the uh, the, the, old, it, it, the sexisms and the violence and the despair come out in these really brutal ways so i think i think we do need to understand that and we do need to understand how marxism fed into that to some extent so i'm sorry i didn't send you this question in advance you had a bit of time to prep it but i hadn't thought about it until adam raised this question which is that the last time I was reading through Thousand Plateaus, or I think it was, might have been one on the apparatus of capture, there's a really interesting section where they cite Samir Amin, his work on, let's say, like dependency theory, world systems theory, and so on, even though he's a Marxist. And, but could you say a little bit about what you think is going on there? Because you're talking about the relation of sort of what dependency would call like core states and periphery states, right? And this seems to be a really big part of their analysis in the Thousand Plateaus of the way that value is kind of extracted, distributed, et cetera, valorized. So yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe a little sort of summary, like what the gist of these ideas are, and why they're citing and engaging with them. And I'm afraid I don't think I can no? <laughs> off the top of my head. Well, I mean, I think they do become those later plateaus, the apparatus of capture one in particular, which I think you're talking about, they become very interested in, in, in the world market, the world system, and all this stuff about ground yeah. rent and, and so forth, which I find fascinating, very difficult, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And again, you're very Marxian in its kind of form, but I'm afraid I couldn't talk about the, their yeah. relationship with dependency theory at that moment. I mean, in anti oedipus they seem to kind of go against all of that. And that's when that line about accelerating the process comes up. I think they become more attuned to those kinds of global problems of combined and uneven developments, essentially. I think that's yeah. the Marxian problem that they're engaging with. I did have a sort of question I wanted to put to you, and this was again based on something that you 
talked about earlier, which was the, there's a passage where, um, in A Thousand Plateaus, where I've got the passage here, we're talking about minorities in particular. They write that, quote, the minorities issue is instead that of smashing capitalism, of redefining socialism, of constituting a war machine capable of countering a world war machine by other means. And so we were talking earlier about how there's a strange thing where you could sort of, I think, I agree with you that I would also be more comfortable calling Deleuze a Marxist than a communist. And I certainly wouldn't call him a socialist in that sense, right? And yet here, there's this passage where, 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 where they seem to, but I don't think I've ever heard them use, like actually use the term socialist else, elsewhere. Like, it's always the communist or capitalist. It's, well, they, so they are, they, they do use the word socialist quite a lot, particularly in, in Antiedipus, but always critically. They're sort of opposed to traditional Marxism or socialism or social democracy. So just as you would find in kind of left communist texts, the word socialism is almost invariably that to which is one, one to which one is opposed. Yeah. So it is at that point, as you say, where, um, uh, of redefining socialism will quite. Yeah. Now I would simply say, yeah, let's just call it communism. That I think Deleuze is reluctant to use that. I don't, but incidentally, I have no problem with calling him a communist. I just accept that that might be something that one has to explain a little bit. I think it's increasingly understood that it's not so weird to call him a Marxist as yeah. one. But the question of what is reconfiguring socialism, or let's say communism, yeah. I, I think the problem of the mind and the proletariat is obviously, I've said it, absolutely key. But the, the, I think a book like Th A Thousand Plateaus almost has this quality of a reservoir of otherworldly or extra capitalist modes of being and signification and organization and libidinal structures and signs. It's like this amazing maelstrom of modes of being. Now, I think that has an, I don't like, well, I think that almost has a utopian quality. Uh, and it's interesting in what his philosophy starts talking about utopia in the door now, negative dialectics and so on. And it says utopia is a bad word because it's misunderstood. And I think that's true. Although utopian thinking has become much more interesting in more recent years. But I do think A Thousand Plateau has this sense of what might life be otherwise. They sort of dive through human and geological time in order to find these other modes of being. And of course, the point is not simply that we can jump to this date or that date and reconstruct those modes of being, but they give us they give us other worlds. And sometimes I like to think that what's going on in that book, in that sense, in terms of communism, it's not so different to what Marx is doing at the end of his life when he starts rethinking about the possibilities of the peasant commune. That it, the, if the revolution comes early enough, then maybe the Russian peasant commune, which has this strange form of collective property could be revived in post-capitalist conditions, a different mode of being, and that he's studying it as a different mode of being. And so I think the communism of Deleuze and does have this really, or even the cinema books, these other modes of being that are so extraordinarily intense and are somehow constructed in this, in this realm of film or in this realm of literature. And I think Deleuze really gives us something there for thinking other ways of life if you like. So long as we recognize that as well as this is this very concerted engagement with the structures of capital and the structures of minority and the proletariat, and that this is where the forces, if you like, of overcoming lie. Yeah, I think we have like two more bigger questions, one from Will, and then I have a, a kind of home stretch question to ask. So I just want to posit something and then I'll ask my real question. The thing I'll posit is like, in a certain sense, we can see, and I think this is particularly true of Deleuze and Foucault, a kind of move to articulate an ethos without relying on a theory of subjectivity. That seems to be the fundamental question. And it's why I think Foucault will intercept Anti-Oedipus as a work of ethics. But beyond that, I'm wondering about this question of the social, because it keeps coming up in relation to Marx. And I think it's one area where perhaps we have to be careful, because in a particular way, Marx quite accurately replicates a lot of the theories of social defense that you find in Ricardo, in Smith. His theory of the lumpen proletariat is a theory of social defense. And for me, it's moments like Marx's historical account of the function of the lumpen proletariat in the 18th Brumaire, right? That we see the replication of a, quite a liberal understanding of the defense of social cohesion and the threat to society. And I'm wondering, 
Is there a way in which we can articulate this becoming minor where we don't simply just flatten it to what Marx means by the proletariat? Because I actually don't know if one can simply say it's the Marxists who produced this remarkably conservative understanding of the worker that has been valorized and turned into an ultimate subject of politics. I'm wondering if, in fact, it necessitates a very particular line to be drawn between Deleuze and Marx on this question, and whether or not, for this reason, reviving that word communism within Deleuze could be helpful. Great. Yeah. I mean, just to your latter point, I mean, I totally agree that the word communism should be more significant than the word Marxism when we think about Deleuze. In terms of the lumpen proletariat, yes. I mean, this is when Marx, in many ways, is most reactionary, sometimes explicitly racist, particularly end angles on the question of the unhistorical peoples and so on. So in, in many ways, it's their worst concept. It, it vanishes almost completely, if not completely, by the time you get to capital. And then there's the really important stuff on surplus populations and superfluous labor, which I think is also important for Deleuze, although he doesn't say it. There's a chapter in my book on the diff- on the relationship between the lump and proletariat and the proletariat. And that was driven by the intellectual climate of the times that I was writing it in part, but also driven, although I never wrote this second half, but also driven by the fact that black radicals in particular, the Fanon and the Panthers, had adopted the lumpen proletariat as their class of revolutionary overcoming, as a way of trying to engage, or adopted or re, re transformed the concept in their own way. And I was dubious about that but also very supportive of their, of their project, if you see what I mean. So I was trying to get to terms with this concept. And the other reason was that post-structuralist engagement with Marx at the time had got quite excited that it had found this class of difference, which was the lumpen proletariat. So they, there was this people like Leclerc, although that was a bit later, Melman, although I like his work, and various other people said, this is the class of difference. The proletariat is just identity, it's, it's uninteresting, but we find difference in the proletariat. And I was arguing that no, not at all. Actually, the class of difference, the class of self-abolition, the really anomalous class in Marx's thinking is the proletariat, whereas the lumpen proletariat really performs the role in conceptually in Marx's system as a kind of conservative return to capital, the backing up of history, the extra capitalist conditions of the peasant. I can't remember the other, but about four or five ways that it reappears. Each time it signifies a kind of, I think actually a conservative function in, well, I was going to say in his system, and no, a conservative function in capital, in society. But it's deeply problematic as a category. And of course, it doesn't exist as a category. It's a fiction of Marx's system in many ways. And there are, as well as being racist dimensions to it, there are clearly workerist dimensions, where sometimes they are the scoundrels versus the good, honest workers. In Marx's more kind of bourgeois moments, that's the distinction. But I think in his system, it is more interesting than that. And I certainly think it's not a category one can adopt easily. But the reason that the Panthers do it and Fanon does it is because um, I think because they're constructing a conceptual and political system in opposition to the fully incorporated, what we, we would sometimes call the white working class, the working class remade in the image of the nation state. And again, I don't mean white people who are working class, but this sort of incorporated national compact of business, labor, state. Clearly, black Americans now and then had to fight very concertedly against the structures of the white working class, which was much their enemy as, as the cops or what have you. So I understand why they went into that concept. I think in the end, I think in the end, it's a problematic concept. Whereas all this great work that's been done on surplus populations and the super, tendential superfluity of labor in more recent years, which is where the lumpen proletariat ends up as a category, then becomes imminent to the proletariat. And that, I think, is hugely important for understanding our time. And I think it's really interesting to note, too, that like there, there are in like the punitive society lectures by Foucault, which is kind of Foucault's closest to to replicating some of the Marxist historian historical gestures. The figure of the lumpen proletariat or the lumpen proletarian is mentioned, but instead the question is not created in this sort of ultra transhistorical theory of a class position outside of this, right? The question will then be the plebeian, the vagabond, 
these nomadic, to take up a more Deleuzian approach, these nomadic instances of relations to power and penality outside of the productive apparatus, right? Outside of the Foucault will put next to the accumulation of men, the accumulation of bodies, right? This problem mm -hmm. outside of that. So I think that, yeah, the critique of the way in which the left, if we say philosophically, approached the lumpen proletariat seems to only ever reproduce the problem of its naturalization as a sort of natural category, which I think only deepens the problems of, of what existed in the humanist writings in, in the 19th century on this, this class of the ragged from Hegel and forward. So it seems instead to move away from it posits a real opportunity to sort of attempt to quell <laughs> the deeply reactionary notion of social defense there. Yeah. All right. So if we shift from what Marx says about the lump proto, which is, I think, really quite complicated, albeit ultimately problematic to what the workers movement says about it. And then I absolutely agree with you. And Foucault spots this perfectly that the lumpen proletariat becomes the category of the excision of what would what the workers would call the criminal class from the good workers who are the industrial labor coming into their subjectivity within the nation states. So the lumpen proletariat becomes the cleansing of the laboring class in favor of all of these things that we were talking about earlier, which is the traditional Marxism, the provider of the subject of labor. I, I haven't read him talking about that in the College de France lectures, but that's very well made at the back of discipline and punish. The question can't be to just pass to the other side of like an apparatus that separates good boys from bad boys, right? The question is to take down the system that produces that separation, because in the end, all you're going to do is verify the separation itself. So I think like in, well, in Deleuze's essay, what is a dispositif? Like this comes up sort of slowly. And then finally, in what is an apparatus, which is like 2006 Agamben, we come back to this problem of separation between the subject and w where it needs to be, where the subject needs to find itself in the factory. And of course, this is why if we take Foucault's point there, this is why the Panthers and Fanon simply opt for the lumpen side, the criminal class, the truly, those who live on their wits and so on. It's just, I think, exactly as you're saying, I think actually what is not really Clearly, the proletarian side in that structure is deeply reactionary, but I don't think we simply opt for the other. We try and undo that division. And capital itself has increasingly undone that division as it's destroyed that subject of labor that was so important to the 20th century. Going through your book, one theme that is recurrent and is somewhat surprising in a book on Deleuze and Marx is the figure of Kafka. And I think because for Deleuze and Deleuze and Gattari, Kafka occupies this position of a preeminent minor writer, or even what they would call a half philosopher. And I like the way that you frame the importance of, of Kafka, especially with respect to the convergence of Deleuze's project with Marxism, or maybe more broadly, communism. Like, what does it mean to have a minor politics alongside a communism? And the idea, for example, that Kafka was this writer, it wasn't just any writer. In, in, in a lot of ways, we're all a lot like Kafka. There's a reason, for example, that in your junior or senior year, you're going to read The Metamorphosis by Kafka. One day you wake up as a laborer in a family, in a job, and your boss comes knocking on your door after you've been turned into a cockroach. And it's in that instant, the way that it's kind of pitched to us in high school is that, wow, see how absurd the world looks? Mitch, you looking like a cockroach and everything kind of carrying on as it normally did. But I think it comes back to this idea of the cramp, as you said, this sort of cramp position or cramp subjectivity and this sort of ambient nature of majoritarian politics, things which appear to us as ordinarily, maybe minorly inconveniencing, like, hey, this is just the status quo. But once mm -hmm. one has become monstrous, it's then at that point that we see the monstrosity of the majoritarian in a sense. And I like you bringing in Kafka alongside this idea of a refusal to work. And this has been a recurrent theme on this podcast, especially, especially with respect to things like the great resignation and what have you, and the conditions that many workers are experiencing in today's world of work. And I want to bring all those strands together if we could. But perhaps that connection on minor literature and sort of minor politics as it relates to what we could, what kind of could be called has been called like infra politics, anti politics. All of this, I think, finds its roots in Deleuze and Guattari, in a sense. And of course, like communist and anarchist politics in the 19th century, like very particular parts of it. Maybe you could speak to that connection. And then maybe 
I think that connection is essentially what Craig, the thrust of Craig's question is. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess, so, I mean, I'll be interested to come back to a couple of Craig's points, but I think, first of all, I think of minor politics, not some, as something that, well, I think of minor politics as communism and major politics as social democracy. Let's put it like that. So it's not that there's a minor politics of communism that could become major which is, I think, which I can see how people might think that was the case, that minor politics is local and personal and major politics is of a grand global scale. That's not how I see it. The, I see communism as minor politics. Then, But nevertheless, it's also a very, I think, a very useful way of thinking, drawing on the Kafka book, thinking about what, what, Kafka himself calls the literature of small peoples. So if small peoples are minorities, those who are torn apart by social relations that have no nation, no people, no self-defined collectivity, i.e. the proletariat or those who are proletarian, then if Kafka operates in that space, in this space of small peoples, these are the conditions for his most curious mode of literary production. What all these, the world, these animals and these monsters and these interminable judgments and these castles and this very strange world that he's constructed. Well, for Deleuze and Guattari, it, it is constructed of and reflects and is the aesthetic of cramped space or the minor condition. Um, and what I was trying to do in that book, and as I guess has been following me ever since, is to try and think about how that is a way a useful way of thinking about the generation of politics, the cultures of communism, the literatures of communism. The, the, I, my last book called Anti-Book was about the publishing forms of communism as a kind of minor, a minor publishing. So I do think it's, I also think it's the strangest part of, of their work or the strangest part of that book. But I think it's the source of communist composition. It's the mode of being, I suppose. So just to take a kind of simple example, think about the significance of the little magazine to the histories of communism, the pamphlet, the slogan, the concept, the, let's say the party or value or something like that just gets worked over and over again. This little piece of idea that is interrogated once more. It's exactly what Kafka says the literature of small peoples does. They can't operate in an expanded plane. They don't have the resources of the university or the broadsheets or whatever it is. So they keep on reworking this problem over and over and over again. And I think that's what Marxism does. That's why it's a minor side. And it's why it's been so extraordinarily intense in many ways and also so effective in its conceptual production. And if you don't, for people who don't see it because it's subterranean to some extent, they still think that the history of Marxism is laid out in the Communist Manifesto. The proletariat will amalgamate in factories and rise up and take over capitalism and it didn't happen and that's it. And yet there's this world, this Niagara flow <clears throat> of conceptual production that I think is a kind of minor literature. And it's sort of without a subject. And it is a kind of bestiary. And it's intensive and insults intended as literature roll back and forth, as Kafka says. And so I think there's a there's the strange consistency of textual and social production that Kafka gives us in his story. So I think is a useful way of thinking about communist modes of being. But I'm also very conscious that I've only sort of touched on that. It's something I find really deeply attractive and also a, an endless problem to work through. One of the challenges, as I see it, and it's not all Marxists by any means, but there is a certain tendency within Marxism that seems somewhat allergic to the idea of art as being revolutionary. And this comes up now and again. And I don't know, I think Dulles and Gattari make a fine case for how a minor literature can sort of aggregate these forces and pull the disparate minor intensities together. And I think the idea of a pamphlet, just the way that it circulates within the interstices of a society between members of a party, between members of a union, that, that's just a great sort of modern example of how that works. I wanted to ask you how you see and maybe I'll just ask it as succinctly as possible, but you know, how do you see this convergence of Deleuze and Gattari or Deleuze with Marx in today's current conjecture with the refusal of work, with the great resignation? Do you think that convergence offers us a sort of springboard into thinking about what's happening a little bit differently? Or do you see any currents right now within labor or within other forms of organizing that tend to reflect that convergence in any way? I, yeah, so I, I'm glad you asked that because I think this there has to be a contemporary relevance to 
Deleuze and Marx. If there isn't, then this is only an exercise. Exactly. And I think, so I, over the last sort of little while, I've been very influenced by the writing in Theory Communist Journal and Endnotes Journal around what, you know, is sometimes called communization, although we wouldn't want to kind of fetishize that, that argues broadly that the subject that was formed through modern capital, post-war capital, Keynesianism and traditional work that, that saw the proletariat amassing in factories and in its independent organizations and becoming ever larger and larger until it kind of overcame capital and that would be communism. That just goes into terminable crisis in the 70s, never to return. And so the subject of labor is lost, fractured, destroyed. And that at one level is a complete defeat, of course, but actually, it's also the condition for a properly communist politics that is no longer about the, the takeover of the state and running it under as a workers' government and so on. So it's at once a defeat and the condition for a radically new politics. Sorry, it's the condition for communism, finally. And so theory communists have a lovely line, which is, sounds exactly like Deleuze, where they, and has no relationship to Deleuze at all, because that's not their space whatsoever, that the proletariat is nothing but a nothing full of social relations. Now, that's mm. exactly the theory of the minor. It's also, of course, Marx's theory of the proletariat, but it's not traditional Marxism at all. So what's the nature of that class relation, that proletarian relation, that minor relation today then, if that's the case? Well, it's this one of a, a global working class that's ever more fractured, rendered precarious, insecure, that's tendentially thrown out of work, that has intermittent work, that has informal work, that has no work, that has to take up the crime and drug dealing and all these different ways of trying to find a means of survival. And that this is the working class today, the global working class. Now, some people like to say, no, the working class was the workers movement. This is the proletariat. Personally, I don't like doing that because I want to keep the word class in there. So whether we, I would call it the proletariat and I would also call it the working class, but it's the working class who exists because of their capacity to labor, whether or not they do labor. And it's those who exist, who are, whose existence is determined or facilitated by those who can labor and support them as they're not laboring or what have you. It's certainly not those who work it's in their capacity to labor. So I think that is our contemporary condition. And Deleuze and Guattari say it in, interestingly in a thousand plateaus. They talk about the shift to ever more erratic work, insecure work, non-work, informal work. So it's intriguing that they get this as integral to their theory of minorities. And they reference Autonomia and Tronti and Negri at that point, which is not what I would do now to understand that. Because I think Negri, it quite differently sees an emerging multitude that's autonomous from capital. I don't think that's at all what's going on. We see social life, planetary life, climate, ecology, imminently structured and torn apart by capital. And that's the condition we're in. So it renders everything very dangerous and very precarious, but also the possibility now would be the theory of communist line that we actually have the chance really for a communism that is no longer about the workers' state, that's about the radical transformation of our mode of being or what have you. In terms of where that's coming from in, in concrete struggles, I think that's a, that really is a big and crucial question. I'm a bit reluctant to sort of pick out contemporary struggles that, that manifest that, but they're certainly now operative. They're no longer confined to the workplace. In fact, they're often not in the workplace. I'm not entirely convinced by the argument that there's been a simple shift from the workplace to the non-workplace and production to reproduction, but I certainly think that border is no longer the one that should be held up as the important distinction. Absolutely. I mean, um, when it comes to, I mean, I think that's just a really good way of setting into whole dynamic in terms of the problematic of how we analyze things, because it is ultimately a theoretical notion about whether Deleuze is for Marxists or whether Deleuze was a Marxist or what kind of he's the kind of Marxist that certain Marx, other Marx, mainstream Marxists may think desirable. And I think there's also, there's very much a tension there in terms of the big D word dialectics. Are, are Marxists more committed to Hegelian idealism than they are materialism? We, some of them very much well maybe be, because it might be a commitment to Hegel rather than everything else. But I know we've reached the hour and a half mark. So Nick, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. It's been, it's been a great opportunity to return to some of these ideas and concepts.